President Muhammad Buhari was in Imo State, Southeast Nigeria, on a one-day working visit, during which he commissioned a number of projects already done by the state government. Among projects which Mr. President commissioned were the Balloon Technology Drainage Tunnel, a Dick Tiger Bypass, the new government house executive chambers, and the Nazi Puli Nekede Road. However, Imo State residents did not come out en masse to welcome the president, despite pleas by the state government not to do so. Many say this action may not be unconnected with the purported sit at home order issued by the indigenous people of Biafra, a secessionist group in the region. And now joining us to uh, discuss this further is Femi Adeshino, uh, 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 presidential spokesman. And of course, you'll be addressing a number of other topical issues. Well, Femi Adeshino, thank you very much for joining us in the studio here in Lagos. Yes, thank you. Well, before you arrived, uh, you know, uh, Professor Akintenwa and Professor Kila had made some comments on the president's uh, visit uh, to Imo State. Second time he will be visiting the East uh, since uh, he assumed the uh, office. Well, what is the significance of that visit, particularly against the background of the threat by IPOP that he was not welcome in the Southeast and that people should sit at home? Thank you. Well, for the president to visit a place, as you know, perhaps better than any other person, he would often be invited. So, the president was invited by the governor of Imo State to visit, and the president obliged. That's the first part of your question. Now the second part, some people saying the president was not welcome in the East. Who dare say that? about an elected president that is not welcome in any part of the country that elected him? And did they forget that this president had fought for the unity of the country? For 30 months, the civil war lasted. He was right there at the front. He says it, that he didn't take a leave off for one day that the civil war lasted. So a man that has fought 30 months to keep a country united. You don't say he can't get to uh, any part of that country. I think that's a huge joke. And again, um, the president is the Oguagu of Abba in the East. You know what Oguagu means? The lion killer. <laughs> so how can you tell a chief not to visit any part of a place where he is a local chief, he's chief in Abba, he's chief in Ebohi, he's chief in Maku, in Enugu, and then you say he can't come to where he holds titles? No, that is never done. It's never done. And then again, he's an elected president, not appointed. Not appointed. He was elected. And the Nigerian constitution has so done it that you can never be president unless it is a representative vote around the country. If you don't have a certain percentage distributed across a certain number of states in the country, you can be president. So if he fulfilled all the conditions of being elected president, how can some people now say, you can't come? No, 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 it's never done. It's never done. It's never done. Well, you issued a statement after that visit in which you provided a summary of the highlights of the visit, including the president uh, acknowledging how central uh, Igbos are to the Nigerian process. Uh, but, uh, you know, many Igbos will say, well, that's just political talk uh, because uh, Nigeria has not been fair to Igbos. Hence, you have the calls for secession. And many had expected that one of the subjects that would be on the table will be the uh, continued uh, detention of Namde Kano, leader of uh, IPOB. Uh, conspicuously missing in your statement uh, was any reference uh, to Namde Kano. There couldn't have been any reference to Namde Kano because it's a judicial process. And when a judicial process is ongoing, you let it run its course. Government should not interfere in a judicial process, particularly not this government. President Buhari respects the judicial process, and he will not interfere in it. Let Namdekano issue run its course. If the court say he has no case to answer, so be it. And if the court says otherwise, we just have to respect the courts. The president doesn't have to interfere in such a matter. And 
It was a parley between leaders of thought in the region from the five southeastern states. They raised issues and the president responded to those issues. And the issues they raised did not include maybe uh, letting somebody go or not. It didn't come up at all. Oh, you mean the uh, amazing the leaders that met with the president, there was even not a mention of uh, Namde Kano. It, can we quote you on that? The, the speech read by President, President General of Hanese, Professor Obiozo, is in public domain. You can check it. And of course, Professor Obiozo is, he, 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 he's a, he's a man of, of education, is a man of the world, is a man of understanding. He would not be bringing something that is before the courts at such a forum like that. Well, I mean, one of the issues that the president talked about, according to your statement, is improved security in the Southeast. Do we have any ideas at all about what the president uh, is planning to do with regard to not just improved security in the, the Southeast, but also in other troubled parts of the country, particularly with regard to uh, uh, increased uh, threats of uh, banditry and terrorism? Uh, which has led at least uh, a very good friend of yours, a certain sheikh, uh, to say that uh, a ministry, a special ministry, as he has been quoted, should be created uh, just to address the issue of banditry and terrorism uh, in the same manner in which we have a ministry of uh, uh, the Niger uh, Delta, and that uh, a lot more should be done for bandits and terrorists. Yes, that issue came up because the president of Oanese directly asked the president to look into security in the Southeast. He said they, they were virtually in trouble from insecurity in the region that could the president con, uh, consider uh, establishing more police zo zonal, zonal command of the police in the region. The president of Oanese asked that directly. And the president then responded that he would look into it, that it was his duty to secure the entire country. So that was how it came up. Then the second part of your question, somebody asking for a ministry for husband and all that, um, it is the duty of government to create ministries. I've never, I've never seen it that ministries were created and ministers appointed because some people demanded it could, it, it, it could be considered, but the owners will still be on government to create it. So the fact that somebody asked does not mean that it will happen. But anybody who asks in a democracy also has a right to ask. But it then does not mean that automatically it will happen. Well, one other major issue that people have been talking about is the MNPC audited reports and the profits declared uh, in the 2020 audited reports of the uh, NMPC. And you have said that, uh, you know, part of the reason that has happened is because uh, the president does not use uh, NMPC accounts as his own uh, ATM. <laughs> How do you mean? Is it even possible for any president to use the NMPC account uh, as an ATM? Well, we have had stories in this country before how presidents will just give notes to NMPC and their wishes got done with their records. There was a lot of impunity in this country. But the NMPC GMD is on record. Even the chief finance officer, Umar Rajia, is on record as saying that President Buhari does not interfere in their operations. It used to happen. But under this administration, it has never happened. And that was why you had that declared profit. But the, the surprising thing is that it seems some Nigerians are already so used to bad news that they have got inured to good news. When that good news came, their first instinct was to pick holes in it because all their lives they are used to bad news. When that good news came, they couldn't imagine in this country, but it happened. It happened. I, I, I watched your engagement with the chief finance officer of NMPC, how he explained that profit. And anybody who is not cynical will know that there's a lot of truth in what the CFO said. Well, I mean, if you say so, but uh, what many Nigerians have uh, done is to say that uh, 
the report uh, raised more questions than answers. That how can you know uh, a body like the NMPC, uh, with a reputation for inefficiency, particularly with regard to the refineries, declare profits? Where are those profits uh, coming from? Uh, right backs under recovery. Um, but I get the point you, you're making, that in 2018, 2019, uh, when the NMPC declared uh, that it, it didn't make any profits, declared losses, uh, people were, <laughs> nobody raised an eyebrow. It was expected. Yes. But now, when it says, oh, we made profit in 2020, the big question people are asking is, where is that profit coming from? Particularly as the opinion of the aud auditors is qualified. Yes, I watched your encounter with the CFO, like I said. And he emphasized that one of the things they had to do was to cut costs. Cut costs of operations, cut costs of production, cost running costs. And it all redounded to the profit that was declared. It shows that there was a lot of wastage, a lot of extravagance, a, a, a lot of lack of accountability in the pre previous years. And the man also said both the president and the vice president never interfere in their operations. As we said in the beginning, we knew and heard, and it was indeed true, that presidents and those in the corridors of power used to give directives to NMPC to do certain things which at the end of the day will erode the profitability of the corporation. That doesn't happen again, and that is why that profit came. Well, before you joined us, uh, we were having a conversation with the Minister of Labor and Employment, uh, Dr. Chris Ngige, and he was commenting on the uh, threat by ASO uh, to go on strike very soon because uh, uh, government has not honored uh, fully the agreements reached uh, in 2020. And also the uh, st uh, strike uh, since August 2 by uh, the National Association of Resident uh, Doctors. In fact, the resident doctors say they want to have a meeting with the president himself. I think they've met uh, with uh, the vice president. They've met with uh, the House of Representatives, the uh, Senate, uh, but nothing has come out of that. Would the president be willing to sit at the table with these aggrieved groups, uh, you know, to make sure that our universities don't get shut down for another nine uh, months or more? and that, uh, you know, resident doctors return to their work? Why not? The president will do everything that will contribute to industrial harmony in any part of the country. But I also recall that in 2020, just before the COVID lockdown uh, began, ASU came to see the president. The president personally received ASU. I was at that meeting. But ASU still went on strike that lasted about 10 months or more. So what I would like to say is that we shouldn't have a we against them mentality in this country. Nigeria belongs to all of us. It belongs to lecturers, it belongs to ASU, it belongs to those serving in government, it belongs to the ordinary Nigerians. This we against them mentality uh, serves nobody any good purpose. Whatever will account for industrial harmony, including on our campuses, let all sides do. Mm, okay. Another major issue in the country at the moment is value-added tax. I know you will say that uh, where the matter is in court, a court of appeal uh, has appealed to both parties to seize uh, hostilities. But speaking as a citizen, as a stakeholder, in the matter, not as a vuvuzela. <laughs> <laughs> was what, that what, what you were? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, isn't that the job we do? You know, it's a vuvuzela kind of job. But, you, you know, we also have our own opinions as individuals. But what's your take with regard to restructuring and federalism? Yes, um, I think the VAT issue is good because the have been talks about restructuring and fiscal federalism in the country. If states eventually get their demands in respect of that, that will be something uh, uh, like fulfilling fiscal federalism. 
But then fiscal federalism itself must be done within the ambits of the law. That is why this issue may and will likely end up in the Supreme Court. And when the Supreme Court pronounces, that is what the law says. If it's in favor of the states, fine. If it's in favor of the federal government, fine. You know that even all the states are not unanimous. You have had some governors speaking out against the position of certain states who are so militant on this virtue issue. So eventually, we will have a legal pronouncement which may come from the highest court in the land, and whatever that court says, then is the law in the country. Knowing the Buhari administration, it will obey the rule of law. Well, you've been quoted as uh, clarifying uh, the statement that the president made when he visited Imo State, when he, were, he purportedly said you will be careful about future invitations to Imo State. Why will he be careful? Uh, could I be out of fear about, uh, you know, the response of uh, IPOB and the fact no, no. that people... Let, 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 let me give you this background. The president always tells us that he doesn't like surprises. He doesn't like being ambushed. That if anything is going to happen, he wants to be in the picture. He wants to be in the know. We shouldn't come to bump it on him. Oftentimes, he says it. I don't like surprises. And he says that is the way of the military. They don't like surprises. So in Imo, he said in his opening remarks that when he was invited, he thought he would just come to commission roads, commission drainages, commission projects that the governor has done for the people. And that he came and did all that. But he didn't know that the governor had assembled the leaders of thought from the five eastern states to meet with him. Because anybody who was anybody in the five southeastern states in terms of leadership was in that town hall meeting. So the president was very surprised at the caliber of people he saw. Because he engaged and interacted with them one on one. They greeted, they talked, they, they laughed. So when he was now closing, he said, next time Governor Uzodima invites him, <laughs> he will then be careful in accepting the invitation, except he knew that the battery of leaders of thought in the Southeast will be at that meeting. That's what the president said. But you know the, the, the tendency of some people to twist whatever anybody says in the country now. They have twisted what the president said to use it against the governor. And that was not what the president meant at all. Well, it's almost uh, 100 days since uh, the federal government of Nigeria decided to place a ban on uh, Twitter, more or less, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and also, recently, we've seen the Nigerian government, through the NCC, uh, shutting down telecommunications in Zamfara State, and also in about uh, uh, 13, is it 13 local governments in Katsina State. And some groups have said, look, uh, both the uh, ban on Twitter or the suspension of Twitter and the, uh, you know, clamp down on telecommunications in Zamfara and parts of Katsina State uh, will seem to amount to an erosion of uh, people's uh, right to uh, freedom of expression and access to uh, telecommunication. Digital rights have uh, been uh, uh, an internationally recognized uh, right. What do you think? You, you, you talk about the erosion of rights when a country exists. If a country is already dismembered, if it is scattered, if we are all looking for safe havens, do you begin to talk of rights? No, you don't. Therefore, anything that serves as a threat to the unity, to the cohesion, to the well-being, to the peace of Nigeria must be confronted must be confronted, and that was what was done with Twitter, and it's been resolved. There are talks, and the last we heard from the Minister of Information was that the talks had progressed well, and that in a matter of time, Nigeria and Twitter will reach amicable resolution. Talking of Zamfara, maybe part of Katsina, the Minister for Communications and Digital Economy also spoke about this after the Federal Executive Council meeting just last Wednesday. He said, when security and economy 
come together like that and they are like on a, on a coalition course. We have to look at the, the welfare and well-being and security of the people first. It's when the country is secure that you can talk of economy. So if communication was shut down in Zamfara because the security people asked for it, nobody should raise an eyebrow on that. And of course, within a week, you had seen the result of that shutdown. In the week that ended yesterday, you know how the security forces dealt decisively with the bandits. They really put them on the back foot. In fact, they put them to flight. Because when they left Zamfara and wanted to enter Niger State, they ambushed them again and dealt with them. So that is the way to go. We must first solve the security challenges in the country, and thereafter we can face the economy. Well, on that note, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Femi Adishino, spokesman to the president of Nigeria, uh, for joining us on this Live Sunday talk show here on Arise News. Thank you.